I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. Yeah, buddy, here we are. So we're sitting yeah. here in uh, Venice, California, sipping on some Amanita Muscaria yeah. mushroom tea, Amanita tea. which uh, our guest here, you guys, instructed me not to drink too much of if I want to actually be able to complete the podcast. So, brother, tell me a little bit about your early life before you decided to uh, take the sojourn uh, uh, of the shamanic path in South America? Well, I had a pretty challenging childhood. And I had a, a very hard family life. And when I entered adulthood, I had post-traumatic stress disorder um, from things that had happened while I was a teenager and many other things. And um, I, I had chronic insomnia and I had all, just all sorts of issues. And um, I had tried like very hard to find solutions, like just to be well, you know, I just wanted to be happy and have a nice life. But there was really nothing that was working. I tried all these medications through doctors and like depression and, you know, all the, all the meds they have. And, it, you know, it didn't really help and therapy didn't really help and... It was just all this stuff that just didn't work. And um, I never felt well. I never felt like my life was meaningful from <laughs> doing those things. And so it just accumulated to the point where one day I was like, you know, I just got to redefine my whole life. Because if I have been living in a way that did not make me happy, did not give me meaning or fulfillment, and I based that on ideas that were fed to me by my culture, you know, then I'm, I got to start over. And so I did. And so I, I just dropped everything. Um, I sold all my stuff, quit my job and, and everything I did in the U.S. And I just moved to South America, speaking no Spanish and not knowing anyone there. What country did you? Uh, I started off, I started off bouncing around a bit. I was in Chile. Um, a little bit of time in Peru, Argentina, and then I ended up living in Argentina for about a year and a half. Yeah. How, how did you know where to go? What led you to Chile as just, the first stop? You know, it was it was very just intuitive. Um, uh, I did once, so I had bounced around for a few weeks when I first got there, and then uh, I had a, a I don't know if it was a dream or if it was like waking intuition, but I saw a picture of this beautiful mountain with a sunset. And I was like, oh, that's where I need to go. And so uh, I started looking around and, and I, not specifically for mountains, but just for like other places that I could do work exchange. And I ended up in this little town called Merlo, Argentina. And um, it's the most beautiful little town ever. Um, it's in the middle of nowhere in the center of Argentina. And uh, it has this just absolutely perfectly quiet mountain range. And you go up there in, late in the day and when the sun is setting, um, it's below the mountain. And it's just so beautiful the way that, that the sun would set there. And so I, I lived there very peacefully for a few years. Yeah. And then you ended up in Brazil. Yeah. And then after a while, I got kind of was like, yeah, this place is safe and beautiful and great. And I've made progress here, but I got to kind of like get back to real life a little bit. So I kind of had reset myself, um, moved myself to Brazil. Uh, had some challenges there as well, adapting to a, a new language and another place I didn't understand the culture. <laughs> um, the cultures are not so similar. Actually, where, where were you in Brazil? To Brazil. Uh, well, I spent most of my time in the South. Oh, okay. Yeah, mostly Florianopolis. Oh, okay. It's the best place in the world. <laughs> it's yeah, amazing there. I, yeah. I love Brazil. I've not been there yet. Yeah. Uh, and at what point did you start to venture into the realms of plant medicines, psychedelics, et cetera? Yeah. Well, I had kind of accidentally gotten into it um, through friends and stuff um, in Argentina and, and a little bit in Brazil, um, but never like a serious, in a serious way. Um, what ended up happening was that I had, um, at the age of about 31, I had spent many years trying to kind of reconstruct my life. 
and like just move on and like just be happy and all that and build this whole new life for myself in South America and spent at that time I had been there for seven years in South America. And um my life was kind of coming to a point where it was like this isn't working. <laughs> um at that point, uh even after I had made all these great efforts, I still had a lot of traumas and triggers and all sorts of problems and emotional issues and whatever. And I just couldn't do anything. I couldn't stop it. Um and I also, uh, at that point, I had chronic illnesses. So I had two chronic illnesses at that point. I had chronic fatigue and I had an in intestinal problem, parasite. And there was no getting rid of those either. And I was like, well, I'm kind of out of money. I'm out of options. And I'm like, I'm just going to like, I'm, I'm done. And, and I had actually, uh, in my mind, I had set a date. I was like, I'm, this day I'm going to end my life because I'm just tired. You know, it was just too hard. Too, the family's all fucked up. And then I go out and try to fix it. And it doesn't work. And I'm just like, I just can't. And um, out of nowhere, a person I didn't know invited me to an ayahuasca ceremony. And I'd never taken ayahuasca or psilocybin or any DMT thing before that. I was like, all right. Um, might as well. Like, <laughs> I'm going to do it anyways. And this was two days before I had, like, planned on actually, like, doing it. And um, in this ceremony, I had a vision that was so powerful that it completely changed the course of my life. It was a vision of the future of the earth and my future as well. Um, and it was just, it was so perfect and so harmonious and just unbelievable. It was unbelievably beautiful. And I saw all of this. And... Um, I knew that I had an important role to play in it. And it was like, if you want this to happen, you have to commit. I mean, I knew that was, it was obvious to me. And I was like, I was like, whoa. I mean, I had a fucked up life. But if that's the future, like, I'll do anything to make that real. I don't care how hard it is. And from that day forward, I set out on a path of shamanism. Just 100%. All I did all the time was going deeper into understanding spirituality, into my own spiritual practices in the way that I was doing it, using psychedelics. And um, trying to find truth, real truth, real meaning in things. And, um, and, and try to find an answer of some, something I could bring to humanity that would be, that would be good, that would be beautiful. Um, so once I discovered that, it was just psychedelics. And on game and on, on. Game on. Yes, exactly. <laughs> at, at and what, it's still going. At what point in your journey did you start to find relief from the chronic fatigue, parasites, and insomnia? Okay. Which, which just, by the way, I mean, I've never had a, a clinically diagnosed chronic fatigue. I'm sure I've yeah. had parasites at different points. But even if somebody just has true insomnia, I mean, that's a recipe for insanity. If I, oh, absolutely. If I go absolutely. a couple days with bad sleep, Oof. I mean, my quality of life diminishes so Oof, quickly. I mean, which is why I've spent, you know, the past many years really focusing on ways to improve my sleep. And it's like the more I do that, the more my life is enriched. And I think back yeah. to, you know, times I'd never had a long spell of it, but different times just going through emotional problems and things like that, similar to you, just unresolved trauma and PTSD and just childhood wounds and all this stuff where... I would get triggered like in a relationship, let's say a breakup or a fight or something like that. And there would be days where I couldn't sleep and I would start to become so much less sane and just able to cope with day-to-day -day life. So it's incredible to me um, that you had this going on for a long period of time. So when did you start to turn the corner on some of those things that you, you hadn't been able to, to achieve wellness in before? Yeah, um, I mean, you just nailed it. Um, I mean, it's sleep is like foundational for every, every single human thing you do. People ignore it in our society for some reason. Um, how, you, when you don't sleep well, you're irritable, like your memory doesn't work right. Um, it's hard to, I mean, it's hard to do anything when you haven't slept well, anything. So how are you supposed to manage your whole stressful life plus your own emotional stuff when you don't sleep? Like it's impossible. Um, and it's also connected to things with diet. You know, I worked as a weight loss coach for a long time. Um, the main like one of the main factors in obesity is just sleep insomnia. People not sleeping well. Uh, it's connected with every illness. So um, yeah, it's foundational, foundational. 
And um, for me, you know, I couldn't, I, I had chronic insomnia for 20 years. 20 years. 20, 20 years. years. From the age of 13 up to about 32, 33. Wow. No wonder you wanted to check out. No kidding. Yeah. It was, it was <laughs> I mean, like, I get like three days, yeah. uh, you know, and I'm in real bad shape. Yeah. It doesn't happen often, but yeah. had you tried other Western or alternative methods oh, of, of healing that stuff everything, before? Everything. Everything. GABA, melatonin, you know, all the herbal stuff, all the, all the tinctures and lavender oil and everything. And it's just like, nothing was like working it nothing was like getting it was like helpful sometimes but not like fixing it until i discovered amanita <laughs> okay amanita um completely eradicated this problem for me wow uh, sleep, it's 100 percent. i microdose amanita i sleep really well deeply every night and like it, i mean for me it was like oh my god like i've discovered like a miraculous substance um and so I discovered it accidentally wandering through a forest in Brazil where I wasn't supposed to even be. And uh, really? yes. Um, Had you heard of, heard of? I, yeah, I'd um, heard of Amanita, it and seen pictures of it. Amanita muscaria. So maybe, yeah. maybe explain to people what that is because that's going to really be the, the gist of this conversation. Yeah. And, then, and then I want to jump back to like you wandering in the forest going, oh, there it is. Yeah. But just give people, a, you know, an elevator pitch on what we're going to be diving okay, yeah. into. So, so Amanita muscaria, it's a, it's a legal uh, mushroom that's considered psychoactive. Uh, I, I tend to use the term psychoactive, psychedelic kind of interchangeably with it because if you do use it at certain dosages, it is definitely psychedelic. Um, however, uh, basically what it is, is it's just a forest. It's a forest growing mushroom. It's the red mushroom that you've seen in Mario. Um, you've seen it in the emojis on WhatsApp and wherever else. And um, it's just commonly known that like people just like, they know what it is, they know what it looks like, but they don't know anything about it or use it. And it's just very odd because it's also legal. And so um, it's like, I don't know why anyone isn't exploring this more. Um, and so I just started being that person. I was like, I'm going to do it. And so I just started investigating it like as much as I could, taking it all the time, very high doses, medium doses, everything. Um, smoking it, doing it every which manner. And um, so take, just, take me back to yeah. the, because uh, I want to get into the pharmacologic sure, yeah. aspect of it and, and the, the mythology and okay. all of that too. But take me back to you being in a forest in Brazil where you weren't supposed to be. Oh, the story. Okay. This was right after I had completed an ayahuasca diet. And uh, that one had gone on for two and a half months. And that was with a, it was with a Huni Queen. Uh, Pajé. After that was completed, I would needed some needed some time to myself, and just to like you know, um, you go on an ayahuasca diet. It's kind of intense for for a while. So when you did this two month diet or dieta, how many ceremonies took place during the course of that time? Oh, uh, well, probably about thirty. Oh wow! Yeah, it was a, quite a lot. I mean, I do quite a lot of ceremonies. Um, you know, the first year that I started taking ayahuasca, I did about a, a bit over a hundred ceremonies that year. Holy um, shit. So, yeah. It's just like all the time going deep, going deep, going deep as much as I can to get to access deepest knowledge and try to use it. And, and still even throughout those experiences, the insomnia would persist. What about the, yes, what about the chronic fatigue? It stuck. And oh, so, wow. God, so, that's so interesting, you know, I because know. Yeah. so many of us, myself included, and I've done nowhere near a hundred yeah. <laughs> ayahuasca ceremonies in the yeah. six or so years or something that I've been working with that. But there have been times where I've been able to go into that quantum medicine realm and, and actually heal things and fix things with, with intention. And many people have mm -hmm. those experiences. So it's interesting that you're, you know, deeply committed to that path yet still it's, it, it's almost like, and I'm sure you've thought about this in some way that it's like, what if the other medicines you had worked with it, with such dedication had alleviated all of those symptoms? It's possible that you might not have been led oh, to the forest that day absolutely. to discover the mm -hmm. Amanita. You yeah, know? steps. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and then, yeah, w once I found Amanita, it was like the insomnia was gone. Um, I still had some issues, you know, health issues. Um, but that became resolved when I came back to the U.S. And... Um, uh, I was doing trainings with a partner of mine and uh, 
through a combination of meditative techniques I was using and the stuff we were training on together and um, uh, diet and, you know, a very, very, very strict protocol. Um, I was able to, using basically willpower um, to like overpower the, uh, the illnesses and they're gone. When you, when you went out on that first uh, sort of accidental foraging journey and collected your first batch of the Amanita mushrooms, since there seems to be so little information out there and so much kind of misinformation around them being poisonous and we'll get into all that, how did you know how to prepare them and how much to use and were there experiences where you kind of accidentally journeyed yeah. versus microdosing? Yeah. Like what was your your first kind of getting to know it and how did you figure out the preparation and dosing and all that? Yeah. yeah, so when I first found it, I had finished this diet. I went up to the mountains um, and I was just taking pictures of stuff. Uh, I, I saw this forest and I was just like, oh, I'm just going to like go take pictures and like move on and beautiful mountain scenery. And so I, I, as soon as I walked in the forest, I saw this like red carpet. It was like a full of amanitas. Wow. It was like grass. There was so much. And I was like, whoa. I knew what it was. And I was like, okay, what do I do? <laughs> so I took off my sweater and I tied it into a bunch of knots. And so it was like a bag. And I just stuffed it full of amanitas. <laughs> and carried it off with me. And uh, then, I, then I went deeply like into researching what do I do now? Uh, trying to figure out how to dry it and then like use it. And I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning. But um, I mean, through research and, and then practicing on my own, using it. Okay. Um, so I there was some information right online about yeah, like, there was, oh, there's boil some. this many grams and yes. this much water for this long. Yes. And there's some general stuff. Um, there's like only one person out there who even talks about Amanita really. And so um, there's not a ton of information that's like most people know about. The dosaging is not like psilocybin. So like three to five grams is a microdose. Um, from that to about 12 grams is an intermediate dose. And when you go over that, you're getting into high dose. And uh, 20 grams and up is like, don't do that unless you're really, really, really know what you're doing and you train for it and you have some guidance. That stuff is intense. It sounds like with Amanita working with it ceremonially, you know, based on what you're describing about the, the dosage, that unlike some other plant teachers and fungi and whatnot. Um, I guess what I'm getting at is you could go to an ayahuasca ceremony and never have used it and you're going to get two big cups and you're going to have the full send and you didn't need to like microdose it and work your way up and do smaller doses. You just go full on or yeah. five MEO or something. It's just like, oh, here, boom, you're, you're in it. So it sounds like with this, it, there's a little more of a courting period and a dating and building a relationship with it before yes. it's useful and safe yes. to have the full experience. Yes, which, that is which what is Amanita, it's the, unique in that. Yes, you in know? that way, it is, and Amanita is unique in many ways. It doesn't have anything DMT like. Um, so yeah, that that is how it works. It needs to sort of work with you for for, for time. Um, it needs to to accumulate and sort of pass you messages in these subconscious ways. Um, Amanita works a lot in, on your sleep. So, uh, you know, as I've mentioned. And so what actually happens with Amanita is when you go into like an intermediate dose trip or a high dose trip, it will, in, it will force you to sleep. It induces sleep. And you will then enter into a dream, which is actually a trip caused by the Amanita. So it's that level of disconnect from your physical body when you're on Amanita. And so it's like as, as much disconnected as you are in a dream, that's how it is on an Amanita experience. So for many people, I think they need to have this, to, to have an experience without their physical body and to experience something that's just, you know, who knows what it is. What's up with a pharmacological mechanism of action? So it's not psilocybin, it's not DMT. What are the active ingredients that provide the experience? Um, it's mucimol is the primary one. Mucimol, which is converted out of ibutenic acid. And... Uh, ibutenic acid is the poison. So this is why it's listed as deadly. Because if you go take raw amanitas and you just cook them and you, you don't prepare them or anything, you just consume them, then it can be dangerous because you, you don't want to take too much ibutenic acid. It's very hard on your liver. Um, however, uh, after you, they have been dried and properly prepared, like at high heat, um, for tea, you have to boil it a minimum of 30 minutes at like a simmer, at least a simmering boil for 30 minutes or more. Um, that converts the ibutenic acid into mucimol, which is then okay. 
Um, there are other things in it as well, muscarin and some other things that do affect it in the compounds, but the primary one is too small. It's interesting that uh, I was researching a bit more this morning in preparation for this conversation um, that animals have been known to eat it. I was watching some videos of mm-hmm. reindeer just scarfing it up and it was like an old BBC uh, yeah. Yeah, footage and they're like, well, we don't know if it's psychoactive for them, but I was looking at them. Their eyes looked pretty funny. <laughs> And then there's a there's a video that's that's a kind of a popular meme of a bear just scar- what appears to be amanita mushroom scarfing a bunch of them and he's like totally high. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that meme. I just want to see it. So, but we we also know that different animals, including the human animal, metabolize toxins differently yes. too. So, is yes. it, do you think it's possible that? Well, I guess it's possible because all the deer aren't dying and are getting incredibly ill, but maybe their ruminant digestive system has a different way of processing that acid than ours and they can hang. Well, the thing is that um, you would have to, for a human to die of consuming raw amanita, you would have to be really trying because you'd have to consume pounds and pounds and pounds of it. And Uh, it's raw and it doesn't taste good. And so like you can't really like accidentally do that. Um, now, I have myself witnessed um, many animals eating amanitas, including foxes. I saw a fox once carrying an amanita. Really? I, yes. I, I have pictures of a squirrel that took an amanita and ate it. Um, so I think many animals uh, consume it. And additionally, when I was in Brazil, I, I had heard stories about this. And eventually, I found videos of jaguars that consume um, bicapi, the vine that makes ayahuasca. And they, they, would, they, would, they would eat it, and then they would like, roll around on the ground and have like a whole experience. Wow. And so, um, you know, animals, they certainly have like a, a spiritual aspect to them. I mean, obviously. Um, but I, I believe that like, like has been theorized that uh, from animals consuming psychedelics, they, it leads to breakthroughs in evolution that then changes somehow their behavior in a way that they discover some new way of living in their environment that they didn't know about before. And then they somehow can, you know, this leads to changes in, in ecosystems. Wow, interesting. I believe that's, I believe that's the case. Interesting. Um, and it makes sense that not only animals would have a different way to metabolize uh, the, you know, the different um, constituents of this mushroom, but also they're so much smaller. So maybe that, that fox is getting high and he's only eating a couple. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Where, you know, a human just, our stature necessitates yeah. much higher doses to go into the psychoactive or, or journey space with it. Yeah. And um, uh, I mean, you can eat as well. You can eat some raw amanita. That's okay. Even when you make tea, you're consuming a bit of ibutenic acid um, unless you do a very, very intense like scientific laboratory kind of um, boil of the, of the tea. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're, you're always going to take a little bit. Um, so if you, eat, if you get a raw cap of amanita dry, it gives you like a centered, like focus, like a clarity of mind and a concentration, um, that's like a million times better than a cup of coffee. Wow. Yeah. Are there, other, no jitteriness. are there other mushrooms that look very similar that are more dangerous? So I know, I know there's sort of like, uh, there's kind of the the mockery of nature, right? So there are often plants and different mushrooms that look very much alike, but they're not, and some are more dangerous. Are there kind of imposter, dangerous amanita-looking mushrooms out there that people would want to be mindful of? Um, not to red amanita muscaria mushrooms. Okay. Um, as long as it has white spots on the top of it and a red cap and the veil, um, there's... I mean, it depends what region of the world you're in. So I don't know every mushroom in the world. Yeah, I don't know. There's okay, tens so of thousands maybe of them. Some probably. country I haven't been to. There's amanitas and something similar. I don't yeah. know. Uh, in Brazil and in North America, where I have been, um, there wasn't anything remarkably similar um, that I have seen. Okay. Yeah, just definitely people need to be careful if they're picking something that is yellow, um, especially if it, it has brown spots. And, and I would say, honestly, for, for, Yellow mushrooms in North America just don't pick it. Um, there are some Amanita gusawis and jimatas that have this color, um, but they they can be they can look similar to some very deadly ones. Okay, noted. Yeah. yeah. What is up with it being legal? I find this really intriguing. Yeah. Since the powers that be <laughs> seem to only want us to use substances that dim our consciousness, such yeah. as alcohol, for example, and no no offense to people that enjoy alcohol. Yeah. I don't work with that particular substance. 
I used to <laughs> quite yeah. a bit. And it definitely uh, muted my consciousness and my pain, which I needed at the time, you know. Um, but it seems that the powers that be really have sought to stifle anything that allows people to access higher states of consciousness. And it's so interesting to me that they've left this one alone. Yes. What the hell? Yeah. That's, <laughs> Why? I mean, I'm thrilled. I I'm have, so glad, but it's just yeah, strange. I, I hear you on that one. Um, I mean, we don't have all the answers, but I, 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 my general running theory on that is that um, when the Soviet Union came about, they killed every type of shamanistic activity that there was. And they would just go kill everyone in a village and just, that was just how they did things. And um, they wiped out all of the shamanistic culture around Amanita Muscaria because they controlled the majority of where that culture came from. And um, I'm sure remnants of it still exist throughout Europe. However, um, somehow it just, it just became unknown after that point for the last, you know, since the 1940s, I guess. Um, it's just sort of this like nobody knows about it. I'm sure there were still people using other psychedelics in different parts of the world. Um, and so when it came time to make all the psychedelics illegal in the U.S., and um, they went on this war against drugs, and they made psilocybin illegal and everything else. No one had heard of Amanita Muscaria because the culture had been destroyed. Oh, that's so interesting. So, um, so it's now getting a chance of revival because of that. Right. That's how I right. see it. Well, there's another really fascinating part of this that I'd like to get into is is the mythology around that. And yeah. Upon doing some research, it's just all these pieces were coming together. And one I think that's really interesting is that the word shaman. Is, is of Russian origin, right? And, and oftentimes we, I think in the West, have a perception that only brown people in South America, Native American people know about shamanism or have their own version of it. And this comes up a lot that in what I observe is this idea of cultural appropriation. And if you're walking around calling yourself a shaman or participating in shamanic uh, activities or practices that you're somehow um, stealing from those people and mm. whatnot. And meanwhile, it's like the word comes from Russia, uh, you know, in Siberia and in Lapland and Northern Finland. And these shamanic traditions were called shamanism. And all of these people were practicing it there too. So it's like interesting that truly no one owns shamanism. It's, it's something that is available to all of humanity. And, and I find that to be a really healthy way to approach it mm -hmm. um and it's it's interesting that the shamanism the original shamanism that area seems very much focused on this particular mushroom mm -hmm. which is trippy and like they did in russia of squelching out that culture the colonialism i guess you could say broadly the empire also went around to other parts of the world including where we are in north america and went no more peyote you know and to South America, wherever, wherever they've come in and wanted to steal the resources and subjugate those people. So it's like the, the oppression of spiritual practices and belief systems and what we would broadly call shamanism has been worldwide. Mm -hmm. the, yes. the powers that be have kind of tried to put those fires out all over the place. Yes. And, and I, you know, which is of course sad, but thanks to people like you and other people I have on the show, I think it's a beautiful invitation for us to embrace the true unity of the and the beauty of all of these microcultures throughout history and and all of their ways and begin to honor them and bring them forth with the reverence that they deserve. And I just yeah. say that because it's there's so much sort of tribalism and weird social justice stuff around this and you know I can understand why people care about people that have been exploited and they want to protect them. That's great. But there's a much broader picture and a bigger story, mm -hmm. I think, here than many people are aware of because we just see something like shamanism through the lens of social media and podcasts and not realizing like, oh, that's actually, that was a Russian thing, at least mm -hmm. when they called it that, mm -hmm. you know? Other cultures had different language, so they called it something different, but it's all one thing. It's like a medicine person, a healer, someone who whose role and gift is to connect with the divine and to find and use sacrament and practices and ceremony that bring people in their tribe or in their community together with that same purpose. And I think if we don't have that, uh, we don't have anything. 
you know yeah. so so anyway that's that's my just observation on that piece but well i think i think it's important for to to place some sort of an explanation of what shamanism is for people because it's just like a sort of vague word and um you know at least in my opinion the the purpose of shamanism is just to bring peace and love to the world that's just that's basically the idea you do it in whichever way works for you and try to do it with your energy and through the way you are and the way you 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 be and um i think that's really the purpose of it is just being it being a person who is caring being a person who is loving and just trying your best to to make that happen absolutely so with the folklore here tell us about you know santa claus the christmas trees <laughs> All of those pieces, oh, I yeah. think, reindeer, like what yeah. our, our uh, you know, the, the cultural framework that we've built around Christmas and Santa and stuff. I, I don't think anyone's aware that there are also origins <laughs> having to do with Amanita that's super fascinating to me. It's just yeah. like, what? It, it all makes perfect sense. Yeah. So a lot of people have heard this by now, but the whole Amanita Muscaria story is that the shamans in, you know, Eastern Europe and Russia, they would consume Amanita and go into trips with people where they'd have a shared experience. And this would allow the shaman to work on the person or give them healing or knowledge or whatever. And um, in return, they would feed them. And so sort of as a, as a joke, I guess, they called them as fat because they would, the shaman would eat so much and then and be on his way. Um, and the... Uh, there's a whole thing about it, their houses would be snowed in and so they'd have to come in through the chimney. Um, Amanita muscaria is, uh, is red and it has white spots, Santa Claus colors. Um, and it only grows under pine only trees. Only grows underneath the pine trees. So you wake up on Christmas morning, you go down beneath your pine tree and you get your present, just like foraging for Amanita. Right. And like our presents are often wrapped in red and white. Yes. Wrapping paper. Yes, and it's all about pine trees, and it's all about Amanita muscaria consumption. It's really strange that no one has noticed this. <laughs> and also, uh, I was reading about how these, uh, you know, Russian Siberian uh, shaman would dry them out by laying them on the branches of the pine tree, and that's where mm -hmm. ornaments. That's come right. From. They would hang it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like, what? Yes. How the hell did we miss this? It's very fascinating, and so. I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. Um, all I can say is that this reality is really complicated and it, it's a lot of stuff needs to change. I think that's... Uh, absolutely. That. And, you know, I also, you alluded to this earlier, but I, I feel beholden when I have people that are, you know, carrying messages like you are today. And when I talk about psychedelics and things, I mean, I'm very enthusiastic about it and have had so much success in the past few years in those realms. But could you talk about some of the risks involved okay. with, with any kind of psychedelic journeys? All right. Amanita included. Yeah, for sure. And, and what, before people get too hyped and excited about it, like let's pump the brakes and go, well, let's create a container of safety around that mm -hmm. practice. Okay, so with microdosing of Amanita, you have very little chance of anything going wrong unless you're going to go drive a car immediately. Um, it makes you drowsy and puts you in sort of a sleepy, sleepy feeling. Um, it is going to be the best option for most people. Most people just need help with their sleep. They don't need to go do some crazy, you know, intense experience. And, and that, that's fine. That's, that's really the best thing for most people. You'll still get some interesting dreams here and there. Um, and you can play with that however you like. Now, if you're going up above five grams, uh, that's when things can get messy. So um, you can get a trip induced at around like seven grams, um, all the way up to, you know, anything higher than that. And when you start getting effects on Amanita, you can get things like um, muscle spasms. You can get some difficulty of coordination as well. If you're on a very high dose, there's this effect called the drops where you have this, this state where you're passing out and then waking up again. It's, it's very surreal. You pass out and then you're awake again, 100% awake. And it's like this knocking sensation. It's very weird. Um, that's, you don't want to have that happen and go drive a car or something. So yeah, I mean, don't, don't walk around you know, 
it can also um, cause nausea. And so you can get uh, issues with that. You can vomit if you take a little bit too much of it or, or your diet's off when you take it. Um, but it's not the same kind of purging as like ayahuasca where it's like a body purge. It's not really like that. Um, usually it's just like one and done. And I mean, other than that, about Amanita, um, what what about the the presence of a, a sitter or guide yeah. and and the intentionality in the higher dose range, right? yeah. in the journey dose oh, range? Oh, well, okay, yeah. For, okay, higher dose, you definitely need somebody to watch over you. The thing about the high doses in Amanita, as I've said, it's not like other psychedelics, okay? And so when you get into high doses in Amanita, which I don't ever recommend, <laughs> um, your perception of time dramatically shifts. And you end up in trips, which can last for centuries. You can end up in trips that last for like decades, centuries, millennia. And I, I've experienced this. And um, if you're not mentally like good, if you're not firm, you wouldn't come back okay. You, you would spend, I think you'd spend so much time down there that you wouldn't, you wouldn't associate with this reality anymore. And so um, this, this almost happened to me. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, it's something that you want to be cool with. Just do it at your own pace. You know, okay, do it at your own pace. Do it in a way that works, works for you. Um, and no need to like push the limits into this interdimensional stuff. Great. Thank you yeah. for that. And I would say that's a, a good blanket recommendation for all types of psychedelic work. Yeah. You know? I mean, I've had friends personally that got a little overzealous and, you know, had uh, dark nights of the soul as a result of just not really preparing and being very intentional and having some prudence. You know, I love the word prudence. It means rational concern without worry. So it's not fear. It's just like, yes, it's, attentiveness. A, it's a respectful attentiveness. Yes. And that's, that's luckily how I've been with, with these exper you know, experiences myself. And it's like, when I know it's time to do it, I know it's time to do it. And if it's a maybe, it's usually a no. Actually, it's always a no if it's a maybe. It's got to be an F yes. And also just the, the safety energetically of the other people present and whoever's sort of trip sitting or facility, you know, more actively facilitating. Like I have to really vibe with the environment and the people within that environment in order to feel safe in the event that it got squirrely and I needed help. You know, sometimes yes. it's just like someone to hold your hand and go, yes. no, you're cool. Yeah. You're cool. The, the you're, issue, you're good. That's yeah. all you need to hear sometimes from someone right. that you know is the, the, ideally probably in most cases not also on medicine. Right. It's like the, the, you're the fine. Amanita, though. You're lying on a mat. Everything's cool. <laughs> yeah. The, the problem with Amanita though is that a person can't do that because you're unconscious. Ah. That's the issue. That's why I'm saying like you go in, you, you got to be ready. Wow. And so you're unconscious. You're not, you're not aware of your physical body anymore. Every time I did high dose Amanita, I was certain I was dead on the earth. Every really? single time. Oh, yes. High, high, high dose. And like, like you can't, like, it's just, this is what happens. You go through this death sequence and every time you just have to go through it and then other stuff changes and you have to go through that sequence and you end up, you know. And that thresh. What are some of the, the you know, you, you talked about how your insomnia was eliminated, the chronic fatigue, other physical issues you had. What are some of the insights you've received at, at varying degrees of dosage that have shaped your worldview or oh. helped you to realize who you are and what you're here to do and how you interact with consciousness and all of that. Yeah. My whole reality is pretty much based off of what I learned from psychedelic experiences at this point. Um, I do them every day and in doses that are considered to be high. Really? Well, yes. I mean, I'll do intermediate doses every day, basically. This is a higher version of microdose and different substances and, and um, different combinations of things that Nothing, nothing that is man-made. I don't consume anything that's man-made. And um, only things that come from nature and that I know like verifiably are pure and good energy and all that. I mean, I could go on forever about this. Um, we've, we've got time. All right, all right. Well, I'll just, I'll just say that right after I had this vision on ayahuasca of my future and the future of the earth, every time I took psychedelics after that was like taking a college class. And I was handed um, like a lesson or several lessons for each, uh, for each 
time I did a trip for each other ceremony. And um, it ended up being a very clear understanding of how consciousness works. And so I was going in these trips to study consciousness and how it operates and how it manifests reality because it is because of consciousness that there is existence. So it comes from consciousness. So if you understand how it works, you can change existence. And um, I spent all my time doing this um, and trying to find better and more complex and more ordered ways to use this, this skill. And essentially all it is, is that attention causes existence. And so the way in which you focus your attention causes the reality you experience. So if you want to change the your, your experience, you have to change your internal perception of how you look at life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I find it really intriguing that you work with psychedelics mm -hmm. uh, on a daily basis. I yes. mean, I think probably many times a week I'm doing some kind of microdosing of something, mm -hmm. uh, but definitely not to the point of it being perceptual or having a journey. Like, for example, at home, I, a friend of mine makes probably something similar to chonga, but it's like a smokable ayahuasca. And it's very short acting and it's the full thing, but it's five, 10, 15 minutes. You're in, you're super far in and then you're out. And when I first got that, I was like, Ooh, I'm going to start to like work with this, you know, maybe once a week or something and just work on things. And, um, and, and worked with it a couple of times and was just like, well, like, <laughs> I don't think it's going to work out like that, at least not right now. It's like, it's kind of on the altar and it's just chilling there. And I look at it sometimes, I'm like, ah, you know, um, but I kind of had the thought, like what you're describing is like, wow, well, if I've been meditating for 26 years and doing breath work and kundalini yoga and all these things, and if I could integrate those with the assistance of some of these different plant teachers and whatnot, I could probably really get some great work done. Yeah. And, and I find that there's kind of an internal governor that regulates me that is maybe that's not what I meant to do at this particular time. So like, absolutely there is. So from like, what was your morning like this morning? Yeah. Well, l let me respond a little bit to what you okay. said, but yeah. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like people should do what, what they feel. Okay. With the psychedelics, follow your intuition when it comes to what you should take and when. I am kind of an exception because my entire life is built around this purpose. And so I take this quite seriously. My entire life is built around this. I have a diet and, you know, all that stuff. And so, um, uh, so like this morning, uh, I woke up, uh, I took a medium dose of Anita, five, six grams, and then smoked some cannabis, some very, very potent stuff. Um, and then meditated for about two hours. Uh, after that, I kind of came out of it. Um, did a few hits of Changa. And then I went to the park and did uh, Qigong. And, Could you describe for people what yeah. Changa is? Okay, Changa is like a slow acting form of DMT. Uh, it's very close to DMT. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, all of that and, you know, doing a routine like this um, pretty much every day. Uh, my day moves, changes a lot because I have to drive a lot and whatnot. But my, my practice is always the same, which is that the goal is always to hold attention firm. And so what happens is, is the following, is that because your attention isn't firm, you start to think about things that are negative. And so your imagination becomes contaminated with negative things. And, and this energy impacts your life in real ways, very real ways. And so my goal is always to hold attention focused and make sure it's as firm and clear as possible so that um, I can live a peaceful and you know, aligned life. You talked about how during some of the higher dose Amanita experiences, time folded. Yes. And all of this earth time elapsed. And, and I think many of us have experience of that when we dream, like when we dream, it's hours and hours, but on the clock, it might be two minutes or something, right? A similar kind of thing. What is some of the craziest shit that you've seen in that space? If, if that much time is passing and what I call folded time, right? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know if that's the right word, but that's how I think about it. It's just like timelines kind of collapsing and folding yes, so that they know they no longer are in a linear sequence or right. a linear limited framework. 
what what have been some of the realizations or just wild stuff that has transpired? Is it past lives? Is what's going on during those centuries of time over a ten hour experience or something? That's going to be a long answer. <laughs> That's good. We got time, brother. We're <laughs> all right. We're only forty six minutes in. We're just, right. we're just getting warmed up. So, the first thing I have to say is that. Uh, you understand what the, you, you've heard of the multiverse, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. my general running heard of it. We're in it. We're in it. Yes. <laughs> just in the concept. Yeah. Totally. But it just if is that when you um, know how a little bit about how things work, you can actually navigate it. Uh, so there is only the present moment. That's because, as I mentioned, consciousness causes existence. So there's only one thing happening ever at all times and a higher dimension or a lower dimension is a different place in time that is actually occurring right now because it's all the present moment so what that means is that if you have a certain skill set and the right training you can go into the multiverse and have a life experience from a different timeline a full one <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> yes. And do you experience those different timelines and, and lifetimes as your single current individual expression of consciousness? Or are you a different version of yourself with a different narrative of a different life? It's different. It's a, it's a different narrative and every, different everything. Oh. Um, so the first thing when you go in is you go through this death sequence. Then you go through another sequence of, of deconstructing of your memories and your personality. And depending on how well you handle that stage determines where, you, where you'll end up. Because eventually, if you're, if you're willing to be totally broken to the point that you are annihilated, you end up accessing stuff that's from other lifetimes. And so you can, um, you can end up in places which give you very good insights about this lifetime because it's all correlated. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you can see what you're doing in other places and how life is and what are things like and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, you come back and use that knowledge here. I think that, I mean, honestly, man, a f just a few years ago, my personality was tremendously different. Even just six months ago, my personality was tremendously different. I really believe that because of these trips I'm doing, I'm actually experiencing more time that I'm then taking back into this lifetime as memories and that's making me more functional as a person. Wow, it's so interesting. It makes sense to me that the way we're created as we're incarnated here is with the sense of amnesia of our past incarnations, right? If you just think about it logically, it's like, dude, we can barely hold this incarnation and the, and the things that transpired throughout our lives and all of those emotional and mental imprints and just the wiring of our brain and how we consolidate memory. Yes. I don't have any desire to be in touch with all of these other timelines, you know, um, because it's enough. Just like get along with your parents or your relationship, you know, it's like mm -hmm. your career, like be productive. Just what the task here is challenging as it is just thinking we were born on this certain date and now we're X age and this is who we are under the name that we were given at birth. Right. But it also seems very likely, and it sounds like based on your experience, that at least taking time to unplug from that matrix pod that is the limited perception of who we are in this lifetime, that accessing those other ones, if you have the capacity to hold all of that in your waking state as you or anyone, that access to that information could be very useful. Yes. I've not been a big past life person. I've not done like regression or any of that, but I did have one. Actually, it was right in that room in there the first time I sat with um, 5-MeO DMT. Hmm. And that was the only time where I had these past lives like whizzing by at one point. And it was probably the most deep mourning that I've ever felt and expressed. I mean, I was just wailing, wailing, crying, like breaking crystal glasses wow. kind of noise, you know? And uh, 
and it was it's like the details of them weren't there but what i saw was that there had been many many lifetimes of me as someone who was seeking god and devoting my life to god and these all happened to transpire in india it was so clear it was there and just mm. like seeing my body burned on the ganges mm. over and over and over and over and over again mm. and it was so painful to mourn those deaths and and to mourn those attempts yes. to find my way so you're seeing how the pain is transferring to this life yeah and yes. i and i had the opportunity to release that pain and and then ultimately it peaked in this immense appreciation and gratitude for myself as my soul for the work that had been put in and a recognition that i fucking made it yeah. i did it yeah. i'm here it's happening yeah and i remember asking god like as that was all happening i said like you know just a moment of surrender and i just said i want it all i want to go the whole way you know the whole way back to god i guess you could say and that gnosis voice was like you're already here you're done there's nowhere to go you just have to acknowledge where you are yeah. and it was i mean and this probably took place in five minutes you know but like you said the timelines collapse and it's yeah. it's lifetimes and the grieving of the lifetimes and yeah. then the realization of like shit all of those lifetimes have culminated in me laying here on this mat going yeah. you don't have to keep searching yes you just have to keep allowing what is already present to express and be mindful of the things that create distortions around that expression you know and be willing to surrender them and identify them as they come up and stuff so in my subjective experience there definitely is something very useful about being able to hold all of those timelines and experience them but I've gone yeah. nowhere near what you're describing, which is like a whole other thing. So I guess yeah. I can kind of extract a question out of that. Have there been times when you're here being dragon and driving your truck up to Oregon to forage mushrooms and doing whatever you're doing that there's um, lapses in this reality? Or you mentioned as like, I'm able to be a con more functional const person. Constantly. I imagine you, you, one could get fractured so that it actually becomes more difficult to operate in this reality yes. as you in this incarnation. But you're yeah. saying that you've gained more mastery over your ability to function as an adult and play the game of being like an American guy doing stuff. Yeah. Uh, are, are there moments where that falls apart and you, you get squirrely? Yes. Um, one of the hardest parts of the, some of the trainings that I went through was bridging that problem of where is imagination and where is reality and where is, do you bridge it and um a, a lot of stuff happening um like what you're saying like when i'm driving um a big part of what i do is when i'm driving is that i force myself into a meditative state where i cannot be distracted so i have like the goal the goal of it is to focus on is to focus concentration of actually that it becomes the goal of the driving actually it's like i'm driving and i'm just driving at the speed limit just paying attention you know just alert and so um even though i have to do it all the time because of my my work with forging amanitas um, i turn this into a spiritual practice um because obviously when you're driving all sorts of negative things can come in from other drivers and people talking bad or whatever and um it's just about no just stay focused and so um what, I, what I'm getting at with this is that when you go really deep, like, like I'm talking about, and you do these like crazy deep trips and stuff, um, eventually what you start to see are synchronicities between what you experience there and what you experience in this reality. And when I was able to get this, this sort of presence built to where I can maintain my focus much more clearly, I'm not, I'm not hindered by uh, intrusive thoughts anymore and all, all, you know, PTSD stuff is gone. And so it's just like, I can just, sense things and um after a while you spend basically no time planning all of your energy is spent on presence because if your presence is deeper your vibration is stronger which means that you can attract things more easily it works similar to like um you know um chemistry uh 
you you have your vibration is an aura, right? And so you generate that with your feelings, and that sets the circumstances. And so um, trying to just manage this as best as possible in all circumstances, regardless of which reality I'm in, always works. The point I'm getting to is that the best way to navigate life is to have unconditional love in your heart. Under all circumstances, all conditions, all people, this is the goal. I try so hard to do it. I can't always do it, but I try harder every day. And I believe that this, this, that right there could, could really change our society. I agree 100%. And that's really, I would say the foundational principle of this podcast, you know, and sometimes Beautiful. we're talking about the material, physical world, the body, and sometimes we're talking about the metaphysical, but this is also my guiding principle. And I think that many people, anyone who's sane and somewhat healthy mentally um, sees that as a viable goal. But I think many people like I used to think about unconditional love more as love for other people, right? Of like, oh, I don't like that person. You know, I'm going to love them unconditionally. But yeah. what, what mine has evolved into and continues to, which is so expansive, is it's an unconditional love for all of reality. Yes. Precisely. What's your what's your perspective on that? You know, versus Definitely. like, oh, I love all people and animals and whatever. But it's how about like love of the cosmos? Yes, and, I rejoice in the glory of existence. Right. Yes. It's I exist, therefore it is good. That's th that's it. Mm -hmm. And so if you if you have this in your mind, you start to realize that the circumstances don't really matter, because your existence in your life is always going to change. And is you know it might change even a lot more in the coming years, and um, okay, like what, what's the problem with that? And including like death, the death is a type of change. Like ancient cultures didn't regard death as bad. A lot of them didn't, and they're just like no, it's just part of you know we born and then yeah you can die, and so it's the negativity that we place onto things that's keeping us stuck at this level of consciousness where everything is you know hard in our society. And the, and the resistance to reality. I think that's the, oh, yeah. the key for me is that unconditional love of all reality is inclusive of everything in totality on a good day. Even the things that the intellect, the internal judge, judge judges as shouldn't be or should be or yes. is right or wrong. Yes. It's, 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 it's non-duality, right? Unconditional right. love is just, you mentioned earlier, there's only one thing happening all the time, yeah. which is consciousness. And it's just because we're encased in a body that experiences consciousness through our senses, it appears that there's a this over here and a that over there, and this is right and this is wrong and that's black and that's white. Yeah. But it's really just at the level of consciousness, all one thing. Yeah. That's the one thing that we can love unconditionally. Yeah. Right? It is, that's, uh, yeah, I totally agree. That it's the believing that there is a duality that makes it so. And so people um, subscribing to that belief um, then they're actually creating it through their attention. So what I'm saying is reordering the belief system to make sure that you have the highest unconditional love possible at all moments in time. That's kind of what I try to do. How can I reorder my thinking and my beliefs and my emotions to do it stronger and faster and more efficiently all the time? And I think that this is like what everybody I mean, should try it. <laughs> it makes life better. You have more fun. Like you have more better experiences. You meet more friends. Like how we met, this was totally synchrony like there was nothing about this plan <laughs> nothing yeah. um so it's just stuff like this happens and um i think it's just when when you were willing to step out and just be like yeah like i trust like i trust life mm -hmm. yeah and within that trusting of life is a trusting of oneself as a part of life yeah right i think yeah, precisely yeah that you don't have to see yourself as separate um i mean we are all god everything is part of god I mean, obviously. And so you're not separate. It's obviously to some. <laughs> well, okay, sorry. All right. I'm just saying, like, it was you're not part obvious of, to me for okay. the first time. But you're, of my I mean, life. we're part of the universe, I guess. Yeah. So we're part yeah. of life. And so, I mean, yeah. everything that's in the universe obviously affects you and has some impact on you. So yeah. we're, we're all part of it. And um, I, I think people kind of have to stop thinking about God as something that's out there. Right. Like, you know, God is out there and I'm down here. And it's like, no, like, you were part of it. So just, you know, let's just be part. Like, let's just be part of it instead of trying to put it somewhere else and like, you know, chase it. 
I was talking to Harry last night and a friend of mine was asking him, uh, he said, man, you probably, what have you eaten? Have you done like hundreds of mushroom journeys? You know, cause he facilitates and, uh, and Harry thought, he said, no, I haven't worked with mushrooms actually myself that many times. He said, I don't know, maybe 30 or something, just guessing. And then he said, which I've heard before, but in that moment, it was very meaningful. He said, you know what, at this point, he's talking to my boy, Elliot, shout out to Elliot. He said, you know, Elliot, at this point, I am the medicine, you know, it's like, we are the guru. And the work I did with, um, with Peter yesterday was very much around that. And and Peter also framed it as, you know, we were talking about psychedelics and he said that there's a certain point of understanding and development, whereas you're not even using psychedelics in the context of something outside of yourself that's doing something for you or to you. It's that your inner guru, your higher self, however you want to frame it, is that medicine. <laughs> Therefore, you are that medicine and it and then it kind of tied into what harry yes. was saying you know um yes. so perhaps there's you know everyone has their own path around this and i know people that have worked with medicine for a long time and then kind of don't they're good and there's people like you that are full fucking on 24 mm -hmm. 7 and there's people like me that dip in when i feel like i'm i'm forgetting what's true or that i'm believing that all of this is true too much and then I need to be reminded like, oh yeah, this is all true and it's also not true. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And sometimes I just need to shake it up and go, okay, yeah. all right, I'm back, I'm back in a closer just gotta feel it. version of yeah. reality. Yeah. I mean, do you look at Amanita or any of the other medicines you work with as, as, as like an ally or friend or teacher that, that exists outside of you that's coming into your field to help you? Or do you view it as just something internally that is being activated by that stimuli? That's kind of an interesting question. I would say that usually when I'm starting off with a psychedelic, it feels a little foreign. But then after I've taken it for a while, it feels more like a friend kind of a vibe. Amanita feels like my best friend. Like I was like meant to meet this, this being and include it in my life and like carry it to people. Um, but other psychedelics, I've also had sort of, you know, interesting experiences with where it does seem like there's some sort of a relationship. Like the, like the, the plant has some sort of an intention with me. Ayahuasca, I know, has in done, it has sent me messages that made it clear that it had certain intention. Um, and I always thought that was interesting. I do think plants are conscious and have their own, you know, spirits in existence. And so I think that they can interact with people. This is one of the reasons I don't like man-made things, because you're taking the energy of that person instead of what came from nature. When you were shown in that first ayahuasca ceremony that there was another way other than ending your physical life. You said you had it planned. What was the plan? Uh, probably won't talk about that. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I mean, what happened? But you were serious about it. I was 100% serious. Okay. I hadn't told anybody. I wasn't even, I was like, I'm out. Because like, I didn't have any close friends. I didn't have any real family. And I was just like, no, no. it's like, I'm, I, I got nothing. And um, what ended up happening, you know, I did the first ceremony two days before and this vision came and then two days later the day that i had planned on doing it um, instead of doing that i did another ayahuasca ceremony and in that one that was very a lot of stuff complicated stuff to explain um but essentially a group of entities came in fairly early and they were like okay you can do what you wanted to do if you still would like to or you can take this other path and they made it, they said, this is what you're going to have to do. This is who you're going to have to be. It was all like written. And I was like, okay, right, let's do it. What would you say to someone listening who right now, as they hear this, is having those sort of thoughts that it's just too much. It's not worth it. I'm out. It's too hard. It's too painful. It's hopeless, which um, I've felt at many times absolutely, in my life. Absolutely. Um, what I'd like to say to those people is that, um, like, I really know how dark life can get. Uh, I have been in some of the darkest places a person can be in their mind. You don't know what's going to happen when you do that. You really don't. No matter how much you try to convince yourself that it's going to be better and that it's going to solve your problems, it is not going to you cannot actually stop existing. 
So if you die that way, you're going to wake up in another lifetime that's going to be a lot worse. Um, if you don't believe that, it's okay. But try something. Because there are things in life that are nice and beautiful that are better than suicide. There's definitely something you can try right now if that's going through your mind. That would be better. Um, even if it's something that may be somewhat detrimental in the short term. Like, okay, but at least you're still going. Um, do what you can to just keep things a little bit better, a little bit elevated, a little bit more positive. Do what you can. And um, definitely try psychedelics. Absolutely try them, try something. Um, if you're on that last day where you're like, I can't go anymore, take something. Whatever psychedelic you can find, take it. Um, it's a thousand times better than ending your life. A million times better. And um, I, I wasn't planning on sharing this. Uh, I am actually a survivor of a suicide. My, my older brother committed suicide. And so I know very intimately what happens to you after you go through that, when other people around you have to experience it. God, it is awful. Um, please don't do that to people. And um, we, had, we just have to take care of ourselves in this lifetime. You're not responsible for everything. You're not responsible for this world being crazy or probably most of your life, life circumstances is probably not even under your control either. So just flow with it and just be who you are. Thank you. It, it seems to me, I want to see what your take is on yeah. this, that as we travel through these different incarnations here, that we have this spectrum of experience available to us in this duality, wherein we can experience uh, things in our life that we would perceive to be negative, where we're uh, victimized or, or hurt or we make mistakes and we're able to undo karma through that. And we also have the opportunity to elevate our consciousness in numerous ways, many of which we've been describing today. And so we're in kind of a perfect school where you can start out at one level and by the time you leave your body, you can be at a much higher level of yep. consciousness. Exactly. And I suspect that if one succumbs to the temptation of suicide because suicide is one of the lowest levels of consciousness. I mean, you're down yes. in apathy. You are at rock bottom yes. of the, the human level of consciousness. I mean, you could yes. say like a carnivorous, you know, violent animal might be like at a lower level. Yeah. But I look at that place, having experienced it myself many, many times, a lot of the time when I was a kid, I felt that way. I have a sense that if you check out at that level, that when you come back, you're going to come back at that level. Oh, you go down. You go down. You go down. Okay. A lot. Um, yeah, this is uh, you know, one of the things that I've learned through understanding how consciousness works and how it expands and fractalizes. And um, basically, if you commit suicide, you are essentially stating that you know to a certainty that life is terrible, so bad that it's not even worth finishing it out. And as I have just talked about a little bit earlier, you saying that makes it so. Like the life I had where I had all these chronic illnesses and couldn't make anything work, that's because of my mentality. I understand that I was, you know, victimized as a child, but so what? You know, it's about how, what do I do with that? And so um, it's really important that people know that the way that you see things is making them so. And so like you were saying earlier, you were saying, talking about, you know, we think things should be a certain way, should be a certain, not a certain way. Listen, um, if you see life as good or the universe as good, or you believe in God, it is the same thing. All of these are versions of faith. And so a person who commits suicide has zero faith. And because they don't have faith in a higher power, that actually stops existing for them. And at that point, their existence will permanently be set that way. So they always have an experience after that, which is lacking anything spiritual. They become a being that will always go down. This is what spiritual teachers have warned about. And so um, it's this, this happens due to the momentum that the inertia they generate from this lifetime. And um, 
it, this is why it's so important that we have love in our hearts. Brutal. It's quite serious. And conversely, if you can make it out of that, like you have and I have and hopefully many people listening, and you engage in a commitment to your own evolution as a soul, seems to me, again, I don't know for sure, but have a pretty strong inclination that when I drop this body at a certain level of consciousness, a certain level of spiritual development, that when and if I come back, I'm going to have the benefit and gift of returning at that same level and yeah. not having to start over at the bottom, yeah. right? Or be even worse than before, yeah. as you described, yeah. that I'm going to come back in and have a much more rich experience of life and a much more God-conscious um, experience because I checked out at a, at a certain grade, like 12th grade, I checked out. So when I come yeah. back, I come back at 12th grade versus what you're describing in suicide is you check out right. at fifth grade and you come back at kindergarten yes. or whatever, you You're know, reversing. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's like, right. woof, man. So yeah. well, thank you for sharing your experience yeah. with that. Uh, I'm curious when you, when you go out and, uh, you know, you take your truck from LA next week or whatever, and you go to, it's foraging season. By mm -hmm. the way, what's the season for Amanita? Oh, it's like, you know, like between April all the way up to December, but you oh, gotta okay. go down to different regions, you go in different places. Okay. Depending on the time so when you go out there, are you going on like, uh, national forest land do you know Sometimes. property owners that let you on their land or you just kind of pull your no, car over and go there's pine trees <laughs> i'm walking up there well i don't do that anymore because i'm not in brazil where uh, you can kind of get away with it in brazil because there's yeah, in the mountains where there's no people but um yeah up here um pretty much just just forest areas national forests and trails and yeah yeah, and pretty most of the power areas. I don't. I don't go to private property to do that. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. not smart in the U.S. Everybody, yeah, you know. we're armed. <laughs> yeah, everyone has guns. <laughs> um, do you foresee any, as this becomes more widely known and hopefully remains legal? Uh, do you see any issues with sustainability? Uh, we were talking earlier about chaga oh, yeah, mushrooms, yeah. and now because there's a monetary incentive for people to harvest um, chaga mushrooms there are some people who fear that you know the supply is going to run out because they take so long to grow which is obviously a much different type of mushroom a tree mushroom yeah. does take whatever it is 20 30 years to grow to, into its full harvestable size whereas these are coming back every year what's what's the deal with sustainability with this particular strain of mushroom well um it would be impossible to ever wipe it out because amanita muscaria grows in combination with pine trees and pine trees are the, some of the most proliferous on the earth uh, it grows basically um, once it once it has formed a connection with a pine tree root. It basically can't be removed unless you burn the whole forest down. So it will just spread throughout the forest year after year. And um, once it's in the roots, it's there. Even if you pick all the mushrooms, the mushrooms is really just like an excess excess part of it. It's a flower that it creates to be picked. Um, and a lot of things that another thing people don't understand really about mushrooms is that the main body of a mushroom is actually the mycelium, which goes underneath the, the soil. And so you don't, um, you don't have to worry that much about reducing its, you know, taking the mushrooms because it doesn't reduce its growth, um, not significantly. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's actually uh, beneficial to go picking them because when you dig into the soil, you're, uh, you're loosening up the mycelium, which allows it to grow more um, this is a very like poorly known uh, trick among um, foragers. I mean, it's not well known among. Sorry, it's not well known. But yes, foragers know that if you if you disturb the mycelium, you help the mycelium to grow. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And do you have spots where you go back to each season and it and it regrows in the same spot, or does yeah. that mycelial network kind of change locations to a different part of the forest and things? Or? No, it's. I mean, it's going to be the same areas. Yeah, pretty much every time. Um, and with like gradual expansion over many years and whatnot. Um, but you can't grow it at home, so you got to go find it. <laughs> That's the interesting thing about you can't it. Grow it at home. Unlike uh, psilocybin containing yeah. mushrooms, which can be cultivated in your freaking closet. I mean, I know people, they send me pictures. They're like, oh, look, they grow like four pounds of mushrooms, you know, in, in a short period of time too. But you can't do that. Even like the highest levels of science can't accomplish this, right? No. They, they have tried to grow Amanitas so many times in labs and stuff and you just, they just can't figure it out. Um, it has to have this connection with the pine tree. And it takes two to three years 
once the spores have, have hit a pine tree root, two to three years before it will actually start blooming uh, underneath the mushroom. Wow. And so it's like really exhausting. It would be really impossible to like factory produce this. You'd have to have a whole factory like with a roof and climate control and like it would be really really You'd expensive. You'd have to like build a factory around, around, a, a, for, around, around a forest. A forest. Yeah, forest. around a pine forest. I kind of like that. That's cool <laughs> yeah. that, that nature went, we're going to give you this thing but we're not going to make it that easy and not let you screw it up basically. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. Uh, in terms of the preparation, is are, is there any sort of a, a, a guide out there that tells you, okay, this much raw material needs to be boiled in this much water for this long and this is how much you would dose. I mean, is there any information like that out there for people? Because I'm assuming, I mean, the vast majority of people listening will just be like, oh, that's interesting. I'm probably never going to see that. Right. But there definitely will be some people who are like, I got pine trees in my, you know, hill back yeah. there. Um, is there a definitive or an accurate guide to teach us how to forage, process, and ingest these things? Um, so there's nothing that's like hugely mainstream. Um, you kind of have to dig a little bit through my personal use and experience in, in trying different things from learning it online and also trying it on my own. Um, the dosaging that I had mentioned earlier is about right. Three to five is a microdose. Uh, up of that to 12 is an intermediate and over that is, too, is high. And um, the preparation method, you, you need to boil it at between 90 and 100 degrees Celsius for a minimum of 30 minutes um, with a squeeze of lemon. I think I forgot to mention Oh, yeah, yeah. With a squeeze of lemon to increase the potency. You can also bake it. Bake it at the same temperature. Uh, but I'm, I haven't done a lot of baking because you can't know the thickness of the amanitas. So you don't know exactly the right temperature to use. And so I don't really mess with it. It's too different. And I'm sure they're different sizes, right? With different levels yeah, of density. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you don't like, know how long it's cooking. Yeah. For. And this tea that I've been sipping on here, you said, eh, maybe don't drink the whole thing because it was yeah. what, like five to seven? Yeah, it's probably about five grams. Yeah. And I'm... A little over halfway through. Okay, and I, I feel lovely and yeah. don't. I feel like I could drive a car easily. <laughs> I'm not going to pound the rest. I, I want to save the rest for before bed tonight and see mm. if I can get my REM score up. Which I'm curious to see. Isn't there some uh, relationship to GABA in? in oh yeah. The, what's up with that? Like, why does it help with sleep and insomnia in yeah. your case? So essentially, Amanita, they're not 100 percent sure how it operates. Like, how does it cause the effects that it does? They don't really know. What they know is that it is in GABA agonist. So you have uh, four predominant neurotransmitters, GABA, serotonin, acetylcholine, and dopamine. And um, these regulate your general mood and your general way of feeling. GABA makes you relaxed and kind of uh, focused. And so by increasing GABA, it's giving you this feeling. This is a really good energy for, for concentration under some, some, some certain circumstances. Um, but it's also good for sleeping. Now, you have to have GABA in order to relax. So for most people, they're so stressed and they're so like wound up with all the tension from their life that they don't really, they're not really producing it. And they need something to kind of push them a little bit, help that get going. Um, so the mucimol molecule actually does that. It, it somehow makes it so that GABA is more easily absorbed and this causes the relaxation effect. Wow, so cool. Yeah, John yeah. Lawrence was telling me that he's been... Um, microdosing, drinking the tea before bed, and that he's having a uh, skyrocketing. Can I have a taste? Oh, of sure, that? yeah. He's having a uh, skyrocketing levels of REM sleep, which mm, is always mm -hmm. something that's a little elusive for me. I seems like a pretty good deep sleep, but sometimes the REM is way off, and uh, I'm always kind of looking at ways. Lion's mane is really good for that. Like high dose lion's mane will reliably bring up my REM sleep. Yeah, um, Amanita is fantastic for REM sleep. If you want to sleep deep, you, man, that stuff is awesome. You wake up feeling so energized. With all the stuff you try for sleep, you always have some side effects. You know what I'm saying? You always have some, like, thing happen or, like, you can't take it forever. Oh, I didn't even mention this. Um, so with Amanita, it, um, uh, you cannot develop tolerance. Really? It's impossible. Yeah. Because of the way that mucimol works. So mucimol can't be digested by your body. It has to excrete it. This is why you've heard these stories about the guys drinking pee because they can, you can pee it out. Oh, drinking the reindeer yes. pee after they've eaten a bunch of these That's mushrooms. Right. That's right. Because the mucimol doesn't break down. So you can drink it. It still works on you. And so what ends up happening is that if you're taking it as a microdose, um, it accumulates in your body and not like severely with the microdosing, but it will accumulate a little bit so that the effect lingers a little bit. 
And so if you're just taking a little bit each day, you're just keeping the sort of lingering Amanita effect that helps you sleep and stay relaxed all the time. Wow. Uh, yeah, and you never, get, you never have to take, change your dosaging. Um, you, some people have issues when they prepare it incorrectly, but you know, that's, that's, that's... That's so that. cool. Yeah, so yeah, I'm sure amazing. people listening are wondering, well, two things. They're wondering, what is this pipe oh, you, guys really? are, <laughs> you guys are hitting, which you can explain in a second. But also, what's happening with the um, retail availability of products? I'm aware of one. Uh, I forget the name of the company offhand, but their product's called Calm, and it's a tincture. <laughs> and I've tried it, and I didn't n notice any substantial effects from it. Um, what's, I guess my question is, what's up with tinctures versus tea? And also, do you foresee in the near future websites popping up, purveyors popping up where people like you are supplying the raw materials and then mm -hmm. this is going to be available where someone can actually go online and Oh, yeah, it's already know, available. Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, I had a company up until recently selling it. Oh, and okay. And so um, recently I'm, I'm transitioning to something else. Okay. So I'm having to switch everything. Got but, it. yeah, you can, you can sell it online. There's lots of shops that sell it. Um, you know, I myself I'm going to go foraging soon and have another stock that I'll be selling. Cool. So, um, yeah. And by the it's, time it's this comes out, you'll have an Instagram because you don't have an Instagram. I sh yeah, I should. At the time it. of recording. Yeah, but starting so, from zero here. So people, uh, it sounds weird, but then I'm like, oh no, that's legal. You know, it's like I'm like, oh, we, we'll talk about it off mic. But <laughs> I'm like, no, it's we can nice. actually talk it's about okay. it. It's okay. So yeah. when your when when you have your new Instagram, I'll put that in the show notes and okay. whatnot, and you know, have people. But people yeah. could effectively reach out to you and be like, hey, I want absolutely, wanna... yeah, wow. and and um, you know, I talk about a lot of like woo woo spiritual stuff. I know that I'm very strange as a person. Um, <laughs> okay, not but, on this show. Oh, thank you. That's good. Maybe I, on a more mainstream. Maybe on a more mainstream show. Show. Yeah, if you were like on Ellen or something, you know, okay. it might be weird. Here, we're all about it. Cool, cool. Um, I just want to say, like, I think for most people, the benefit of Amita really is like the health benefits and the reduction anxiety, the cutting through the stress. Like, you take this stuff, you just feel calm and good. No bullshit. No side effects, you know what I'm saying? Like you just take a little bit of it and you're like, okay, the stress is like gone. And like just that for most people, oh my God, like that's like, look how much stress. I, I want that. Yeah. <laughs> like everyone is stressed. Like let's, let's I have a really great problem. life and I'm still, well, yeah. I might bite the shit out of my fingernails on, even on great yeah, days. Just, so this, I, this is a stressful dimension. <laughs> I do have, you know, my, my moments of like overwhelm and things like that. So you guys uh, that are watching the video, you've seen us taking some pulls off this really beautiful giant pipe that Dragon had with him today. And we're smoking some really lovely uh, mapacho tobacco after you've taken your, your uh, dose there. Would you tell us about the origins of this yeah. beautiful pipe and, and where you got it and what's in it? Um, yeah, so, so I got this pipe um, from a shaman in Brazil. And the way that he works is he'll, um, he'll take microdoses of ayahuasca and then he works on his art as, he, as he's doing that. So he's getting these like superior connections with the art. And the guy was really interesting because he lived in this corner of the island I lived on, Florianopolis. He lived in the corner of this island where there was no people. And um, he had this tiny little shop in a, in, a, in a room inside of his house. And he was just like, yep, this is my stuff. And he was explaining to me that he would, he would, when he was making each thing, he said that each item, he would know who it was for. And so he would um, do his work and he would just have like maybe five to 10 items in stock. And when the person showed up and bought it, he would, okay. And this was just how he worked. And he's oh, like wow. been doing this for decades. Wow. Yeah, really interesting guy. I mean, that is such a cool piece of art. It's like I think it's, I think it's beautiful. Oh, it's insane. Yeah, I'm it's so lucky to have it. It's <laughs> like, so special. I was lucky that it was offered to me. Uh, yeah, it really is. And that tobacco yeah. is really nice too. Yeah. yeah, I haven't been smoking any kind of tobacco for quite a long time. And today I was like, you know what? I think I can give myself a pass and enjoy this. How'd you get your name? Oh, all right. So we're going to have to go back to talk about that second ayahuasca ceremony I did. This is not a complete answer to the question, but I'm going to give you some pieces. Um, during the ceremony and, and slightly before it, um, I had seen in my sort of peripheral vision this green dragon kind of around. And this was something that 
it was kind of those like you look in the corner and there's nothing there kind of thing and you're like i'm sure i saw something there and this happening like frequently i was like all right whatever something something that my imagination is going off or whatever and um during the second ayahuasca ceremony after these entities appeared and they made this commitment with me um Sometime after that, a lot of stuff happened during that ceremony that I won't go into, but I took quite a lot of ayahuasca. I took about five doses. And uh, this is like good grade Brazilian quality ayahuasca. Um, and I kept having, I had this feeling like everything was going to go wrong. And I was like, oh God, what do I do to fix it? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And I was like running around the ceremony like, trying to find out help some get help from someone or like i didn't know what the fuck to do <laughs> but i was freaking out i was having a panic attack and you know people would, i'd be like help me help me and the people would be like we what do i can't help you so i ended up just like okay just like you had said earlier like you just i was like i'm just gonna let go like lie down and like if, if this doesn't work out for some reason, okay, whatever. I tried. And so I went and laid down. And um, I was down there for a while. Uh, and the ceremony ended. And I was having this weird sense of like energy building up. Like, like, it's like a deep building of energy. And the ceremony ended. The people started leaving. And at some point... Um, I started getting these like movements in my body that I wasn't controlling. <laughs> and um, I started feeling this kind of energy coming towards me. And then all of a sudden I had this vision of a green dragon that was flying to exactly like the Chinese dragon with the short arms and the short wings and the big like wavy uh, mustache thing. And it was, came at me and it was like, Rah! and it jumped into my body from the astral. And at that point, there was like this explosion of energy. And I started moving in ways that I don't know how. I started dancing. I don't know how to dance. I didn't at the time anyways. And it was like doing this crazy dance. Um, and I was speaking as well in a language that I don't know what it was. It was this like guttural language. And um, the only thing I could say in English that entire time was, I am the laughing dragon. I am the laughing dragon. <laughs> and I kept saying, I am the laughing dragon. It's who I am. I was in a state at that time of just like letting go because I knew I had to let go of my old life because it was bad. I didn't want it anymore. And I was like, okay, I'm going to accept whatever is going on here. I don't know what this is for or why, but it's a ayahuasca ceremony. Like these people can handle it. We'll just, I'll, I'll have to, I have to do this. And it was this very crazy experience um very powerful and for weeks after that no, months actually um i had the most profound insights and intuitions about things and abilities of perceiving like feeling another person's emotions or energy like without talking to them um all sorts of intuitive capabilities opening up and i i saw all of this and i was like all right um I guess I just got to kind of like go with this. Like, what else am I going to do? I'm not going to, you know, <laughs> what else am I going to do at this point? I just, I'll just go with this. Okay. I just started, it was, it took a while. It was very, it took like, it took like six months for me to be comfortable introducing myself as Laughing Dragon. It was so weird. I can imagine. You know, it was, and it still, it still gets weird sometimes, but I'm just like, I don't care. This is who I am. This is what I understand about myself. And this is what I'm going to be. So, yeah. Wow. Well, congratulations for embracing Thanks. it. And it makes for a great podcast title. I, mean, it's <laughs> yeah, like, I would want to cool. listen to that Laughing Dragon. Who's this guy? I'm glad, I'm glad it was that name because that's a cool sounding name. I'm glad it wasn't something weird. or. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've met know? people and interviewed people. Uh, there was a woman who, God rest her soul, passed. And uh, her spiritual name was Guru Jagat. And huh. her teacher had given her that name and she hated it. And she was mortified by it. Huh. And it took her a very long time to be able to sit with it and be mm. comfortable using the name because there were many things about it that were kind of triggering to her, you know. Lucky for me, I've not had to 
had the opportunity to go through that and i'm just yeah just luke it's easy <laughs> but yeah respect dude yeah well you. hot damn man thank you so much for for sharing your experience thank you for thank coming you. over here uh yeah. you know a special thanks to our, our mutual friend harry for oh yeah letting us use his beautiful awesome. backyard here it's been nice soaking up some california sun and green plants that i don't have back home in texas and meeting people like you awesome man yeah. thank you yeah well you you're a, a nomadic forager of these truly magic mushrooms so we're not going to send people to your website but i will make some show notes for this and we'll call it lukestory.com slash dragon okay just easy to remember and uh, by then we'll put your instagram in there and have ways for people to get in touch with you that other people that want to interview you or just learn yeah. from you and explore your world so thank you so much for making the time today awesome thank you for having me